I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Not that long ago, New York City had a mayor who was worth, personally, 20 or 30 billion dollars. At the same time, there were upwards of 50,000 people crammed into the city's homeless shelters every night. About 20,000 of those shelter inhabitants were children. Those are the kinds of extreme wealth and income disparities that are warping the very idea of America as an egalitarian society. No one writes about the reality of inequality better than my guest, Eduardo Porter, the sharp and perceptive and insightful journalist who writes the economic scene column for the New York Times. Eduardo, welcome. Hey. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. So obviously there are not a lot of people with 30 you know, billion dollars, <laughs> um, but there are some um, pretty extreme disparities out there. So give us a sense of the inequality now and sort of contrast it with uh, prior er eras. Well, um, I mean, just to, to, to uh, jump off from your, from your example, we have about the, the 0.1 percent of the population, so that's one out of every thousand Americans, they control about one out of every ten dollars the economy wow. produces in, in income every year. <laughs> so 10 percent of all our national income goes to 1.1 percent of families. Mm -hmm. Uh, one out of every five dollars goes to the one percent of families. And at the same time, you know, to go to the other end, we have uh, roughly 50 million people living in poverty um, by, you know, the official government measure. Which a lot of Americans don't realize. Yes, that's right. I mean, this is a population that most people prefer to ignore. And this is really uh, historically unique. I mean, we haven't experienced this level of concentration of income at the very top since the late 1920s, um, in fact. After the 1920s, there was a big egalitarian movement called, well, you had the New Deal and you had World War II, which right. destroyed a lot of assets of the rich. Right. And then you had like big movements in, in, in progressive taxation and an expansion of a social safety net. And so you had a, a pretty much of a leveling down of, of, of incomes that lasted up until, you know, the early 1980s. And from the early 1980s to this day, um, with slight little blips here, as in the Great Recession just a few years ago, where the income at the very top came down a bit, but it's now bouncing back up. So we've got this like long upward period that's been going on for 35 years or so. And just like I think that um, there's a lot of people who don't realize how much poverty is still in the United States, I think a lot of people don't understand how extreme these wealth and income disparities um, have become. Explain why ordinary individuals and families really should care about this. I mean, at the end of the day, this, the disparities in income are, are result in all sorts of other disparities. Disparities in educational attainment, disparities in health, disparities in longevity. The poor live shorter lives than the rich. The babies of, of poor women die at a higher rate than the babies of rich women. So there's all these really um, other social consequences of the kind of deprivation that our lopsided society has produced. And so these are really actually, you know, a pretty terrible outcomes. We, we compare horribly with every other rich country on earth in all these statistics, infant mortality, uh, uh, years lost of premature uh, death, diabetes, and all these things are correlated with inequality. Mm -hmm. So we have a presidential campaign going on uh, now, um, and it's, it's actually a campaign like none I've ever seen before. But one thing is pretty much the same as other campaigns. There's very little talk about poverty among the candidates. Yeah. Um, is this basically because the candidates assume poor people don't vote, or is it that Americans really don't care about poverty? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think your first, your first uh, uh, insight there is, is probably correct. The poor vote at a very low rate. Right. And so it's much more efficient to go after the middle class, which is also you can create slogans that are more about opportunity and possibility when you're talking about people that you think roughly are in the middle than when you're, 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 you're talking about policies to perhaps alleviate the misery at the very bottom. So you know, it's very difficult to craft kind of like a, a let's do it uh, a sort of slogan. And nobody has tried, I'd say, it since Lyndon Johnson, basically. Right. Um, um, it's been a kind of like a forgotten population. The poverty rate has remained roughly stable over 30 years. Um, even as the, the economy has grown by tons and, and, and the income of the very rich has, has increased remarkably. One of the things I've been curious about, I, um, I think it was 1996, that... Um, 
Bill Clinton gave us an overhaul of welfare. They called yeah. it um, reform. Yeah. We've since had a terrible recession, almost yeah. a depression since then. Um, how has that so-called welfare reform worked out? How, how well did the government do in terms of benefits when we were in that economic distress? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it kind of goes to show that a reform that, that can be seen to work sort of okay when the economy is booming and we have, you know, full employment doesn't really work that well when these other things fall apart. And so, in fact, the experience in this great recession with, with poverty and especially with people that are at the very, very bottom, you know, at half the poverty rate, there's like 20 million Americans that live on, you know, that live on half of, of, of what the poverty line is. Um, for them, you, you can see that the safety net is pretty much no longer there because we, got, we did away with the entitlement to government mm -hmm. assistance for the poor and we replaced it with programs that are all associated with working. So if you don't work or if you don't work enough hours or if you don't earn enough, really the safety net isn't there for you in, in a large extent. One of the big um, aspects of the safety net has been Medicaid, which is health, mm -hmm. health services yeah. um, for the poor. Um, we have so many Republican governors um, under Obamacare who have refused to expand Medicaid benefits, even though those benefits would be almost entirely paid by the federal That's, government. Yeah. That, that seems really cruel to me. These are folks who need health care and are not getting it. What's the rationale yeah. behind this? Why is this happening? I mean, I think my first answer would be they want to destroy any policy that comes from the Obama administration. And, and even if it harms even exactly people. it's a take no prisoners kind of approach to destroy the president's policy platform. But still, I still find it really remarkable, as you point out. And I was uh, earlier this year, I was at a, in, in Columbia, South Carolina, at a summit about poverty held by, by Republicans, by uh, a right leaning uh, think tank. And most of the Republican candidates were there talking about how much they cared about poverty and what kind of policies they would put in place. So they were trying to sort of like at least making an effort to, to put some ideas about poverty. And I was you know, faltering about, well, how can I trust this when at the same time, you know, they're refusing to fund Medicaid? Right. Um, it, it, right. There's, a, there's a mismatch yeah. uh, between the rhetoric and the actual policies that are being put in place. You wrote a really interesting, you've written so many really interesting columns. It's like one after another. I, I honestly think um, you're one of the best columnists on the New York Times. Folks should be the, reading the economic you. scene thank column. You. Um, one of the uh, really terrific ones was about education. And you pointed out that um, the disparities in education between affluent and poor youngsters are now greater than the disparities between um, African American and white youngsters. Talk about that a little bit, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yeah, that's that is really a kind of like a. Uh, it takes a, a, a minute to to kind of like take in that information and think about it a bit, but um, there was at one point in our history um, a, a, a real attempt to use education as a as a motor of opportunity, as a, a you know as 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 a, as a mobility. And so there were clear uh, efforts from, you know, the 60s through to the 80s to kind of like really um, um, improve the education of, of those most left behind, which in this case were largely um, African-Americans, Latinos, people of color. And so there was some progress. Um, and then that progress faltered to a large extent in the 1980s. And though then it picked up again with kind of like the no child left behind sort of policies. You do see a bit of a closing of the gap. But at the same time as these efforts were going on, you can see, especially again, starting in the 1980s, a really big widening in the social, socioeconomic status gap. So folks at the bottom 10% of the socioeconomic status, which is kind of like a mixture of income and parental education and so forth, right. um, really, really uh, fell behind uh, um, those richer, richer folks at the top. And, um, and our education system really has done nothing to close that gap. And it has done nothing for years and years and years, which is, to my mind, one of the great policy failures of this country. So the, the situation now when you talk about education is these affluent families, and it's understandable, they can spend a lot of money uh, in addition to yep. whatever kind of benefits the kids get in school. So they have tutors, they have coaches, they have uh, art enrichment programs uh, for their kids. Yeah. Um, as a society, what are some of the things, um, counteract is not the right word, you don't want to take benefits away yeah. from kids, but 
uh, what are some of the things that you could do to lift the educational yeah. standings of poorer kids. I think an important thing to understand is it's not just, as you kind of suggest, it's not just about the education apparatus. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is happening in the home even before these kids right. go to, to set, set foot in school. So the, 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 the kind of like the achievement gap before starting kindergarten is already pretty big. Mm -hmm. And then it gets bigger in the school years, but it's enormous before they even start going to school. So I think if you're thinking, well, let's, let's be an enlightened government and think of what kind of policies we put in place to do that, you have to start before school. You have to start with families. And so, I mean, you're talking income support, child support, you know, kind of like assistance with, with parenting, um, and, and all those things where, you know, affluent parents are already way ahead of the game, right. you know, with all these enrichment things and tools and stuff. And they're better educated themselves. Exactly. And, and low-income parents, which probably have a lower level of education, or often single parents, you know, who have a hard scrabble and difficult life. I mean, these don't really have the, 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 the supports they would need to get their kid into school-ready status by the time they start school. Right. Then the schooling, then the educational system in the United States, which is becoming increasingly segregated by income is another, you know, is another thing that I think needs to be fixed. And partly it has to do with the way schools are funded, you know, through property taxes. Right. So when homes are expensive, the school gets a lot of money and when homes are cheap, schools don't get that much. And so these kind of disparities in the, in the, in the sort of capabilities of schools is also an important part uh, um, of, the, of the problem. And so you find, studies find that kids in, in, in poor neighborhoods get uh, more junior teachers that are less experienced. They are kept back a year rather than forced to improve and, and, and make it into the Which next ultimately year. Uh, often turns out to be disastrous. Oh yeah, holding kids back is probably the worst thing you yeah. could do um, yeah. a, a, as a policy choice for a kid. So throughout the school system, then by the time they live high school, well then you have enormous, enormous disparities in, 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 in capabilities of going to college and taking advantage of a college education. Wow. You addressed a seemingly age-old question in a recent column. Um, why do so many white working-class voters support conservative policies that undermine their own economic interests? Yeah. Um, Give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many theories about that, right? I mean, there's a what's the matter with Kansas right. kind of a, a deal where, you know, the right gets to them with policies on gun control and, 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 and homosexuality and marriage through moral issues. Right. And then they ultimately, you know, even though their economic interests are not served by this particular, by the party that's, that's, that's luring them with these, with these moral calls. But I would argue, I would argue, I think there's something more profound going on. And I think that there's something that underlies a lot of the, what I would call the dysfunctional uh, evolution of policy across the board in the United States. And I think it has to do with, with ethnic and racial diversity. Right. I think it has a lot to do with kind of like the reaction of what was once a white minority, a majority, I'm sorry, that had like absolute control over political yep. power as, as they see that power slipping away. I mean, first with desegregation, they see, you know, black kids on the streets and in the institutions that they once thought were their own. In the schools. In the schools, exactly. And then through time, as, as you know, through immigration, we have more Latino kids and Asian kids. And so now they're like, whites are about 60% of voters. I mean, 20 years ago, they were, um, or 25 years ago, they were 80. Um, and so this loss of power, I think, is really, really frightening to a, to a set of, of, um, of white voters, especially if they're going through tough economic times themselves. Right. And I think this has a lot to do with explaining, you know, right now, especially, the movement of, you know, white, especially less educated white voters to candidates from, from the extreme populist right. In, in writing about that, one of the things you said was uh, perhaps even more than economic status, racial, ethnic, and cultural identity is becoming a main driver of political choice. I agree with that. I mean, we, we, we see it every day. We cover it. But isn't that one of the major factors driving the, the Donald Trump boom oh, in, in, in this election? Exactly right. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think that this, this, that race has driven policy in sort of like subtle and less subtle ways for decades. So if you ask me, what's my overriding thought about why our social safety net has weakened so much over 40 years that we allow such high infant mortality rates and such high premature death rates, I think it has to do with, with um, 
basically the kind of like the, the, the racial mistrust that makes, uh, that, that makes trust in government more difficult for, for white voters. So why fund a government safety net if the, if the assistance from that safety net is going to go to ethnic minorities? Right. You know? well, well, one of the more ominous things that you wrote was um, you said that the reaction of whites who are struggling economically raises the specter of an outright political war along racial and ethnic lines. Again, yeah. I see the, the seeds, or maybe even more than the seeds of that going on um, already. But my question is, if that were to happen, this is ironic because it's where we started. If that were to happen, which obviously I think it would be catastrophic, wouldn't it be struggling white individuals and families who would be among the worst who would be hurt? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, indeed. I mean, who's hurt by the dismantling of the social safety net, <laughs> right? So, so William Julius Wilson puts it really succinctly. He says, whites oppose government welfare because they see it as being forced through their own taxes to pay for stuff for white, for, for blacks that they can't afford for their own families. Right. So the, the public safety net is defunded, and who suffers? It's everybody. Every, everybody that's living below the median at any rate. And there's a lot of whites living below the median um, as well. And so this is basically an uh, undermined solidarity that, that, that is really hurting to the, the entire kind of like social cohesion, the entire um, uh, pro proposition of this country. So when we talk, as uh, people frequently do, about the quality of life in parts of Europe and especially in the Scandinavian countries, for example, um, that's in large part because of sort of the robust government support that you see yeah. in those countries. And we are just generally hostile to that in the, in the United States. In indeed, indeed. There's a, I think there's a risk now in Europe that the Europe takes a sort of an American path, as it were, under the pressure of immigration. America's problem with race, I think, is similar to Europe's problem, problem with religion. With right. So they, they're, I think that they are building the kind of hostility now that has been in the United States for longer, mm -hmm. and that might undermine, I think, the kind of the cohesive policies that exist today in social democratic Europe. One of the things I've tried to uh, write a great deal about over the years has been jobs um, oh. and employment. And if you uh, want to talk, talk about bolstering the middle class, yeah. um, uh, fighting poverty, obviously, in a country like the United States, employment is, is critically important. But what we're seeing happening is uh, a smaller and smaller percentage of the population is actually employed in yeah. the United States. And um, fewer and fewer good jobs are, are being created. A, lo a lot of the formerly good jobs are being taken over you know, by technological mm -hmm. um, advances. Um, is this a trend that you just see continuing? And if so, what are the implications there? What are the economic implications? Yeah, well, th that's a really big question. Um, the hollowing out of the middle of the labor force um, has been going on for a long time, and I think it is go still going on today. As you know, globalization and machines take out a lot of the occupation, the routine, repetitive jobs that used to produce like fairly decent jobs with right. fairly decent wages. I mean, a lot of those have already gone. And you didn't need a lot of education. And you didn't need a lot of education, exactly. So the standard policy prescription has been, okay, well, we need better education. We need more education, we need more. But the education system, as we have just right. talked about, is really not up to speed. And in fact- So the very people who need the education to get the better jobs yeah. are the ones that are in the struggling environment. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, and, and not only that, I mean, I think I've uh, always been somewhat skeptical that education is the entire story. I agree, 100%. Um, <laughs> and, and there are a bunch of kind of like ancillary policies that presumably could help you know, around giving giving workers more voice. Yep. Uh, uh, unions are right now decimated in yep. the United States. They are pretty much powerless. And I think that that has, that has a lot to do with um, like, kind of like the, the, the stagnating wages and general powerlessness of labor. Um, there are um, policies about, you know, again, the social safety net, income policies, um, income support policies that, that could be put in place to essentially um, help workers that are on the wrong side of the changes in the labor market. Right. Um, but as to what are like the macro trends in terms of, you know, job displacement, it's really interesting because 
you could say, yeah, well, machines have been taking a lot of jobs or taking away a lot of occupation. They're probably going to continue to do this. And well, what's the end game? Zero jobs, or <laughs> you know. Right. Um, but then you look at you look at. Um, our economic stats, and as there's um, an economist called Bob Gordon from Northwestern University just came out with this big book, like looking at the past and the future of technology, and he says, you know, actually, we don't see technology doing a lot right now. What, you know, how we measure it, something called total factor productivity, has actually been really, really low by historical standards. Is that right? If machines were really, you know, right now, like, zooming ahead, we'd see that moving much, much faster. So, so I'm again. I, this is a really, you know, forecasting the future is particularly <laughs> difficult. <laughs> right. um, so it's 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 very hard to figure out how is this going to pan out. So we uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, but you know, big questions because you write about big issues. So looking ahead on, um, if we're talking about wealth and income inequality. Um, what are the trends? I mean, are we making any progress here or is it just going to constantly get worse? That's the first part of the mm -hmm. big question. And the second part is, if you could wave the magic wand, what are some of the major steps that you'd like to see taken? I mean, I, I think the trend right now is still for, for increasing inequality. Increasing inequality. It right. doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. And I cannot tell you what the forces out there in the world would make it stop and revert right now. but. I mean, in terms of what policies we could use, we could use, you know, policies to restore uh, um, collective bargaining power to, to workers. So Such that there's a big issue, which I think does not get enough attention. Workers have no clout, no exactly. leverage in the workplace at all. You exactly. can only get that if you're organized. Yeah. Yeah, that I think that we need. I think that we need uh, more tax revenues. The government needs more tax revenues to build mm -hmm. a more solid safety net, because if, as as, as we point out, the, the labor market is going to get more difficult, mm -hmm. well, then we're going to need to another source of income for people below the middle right. of the distribution. And you know, the government through taxes is one of the, the functions it's historically had. I think it doesn't do it well, and to do it well, it needs more money. So I think we need, you know higher taxes on the rich, but perhaps also higher taxes on other parts of the distribution in the middle as well. Right. Um, I think that, you know, sort of like maybe um, if there's a problem in the labor market that is persistent, how about a guaranteed jobs? Tony Atkinson of Britain, who's a, an economist that studied inequality extensively, he's proposed guaranteed government job at a certain wage that is considered a living wage. I'm absolutely in favor um, of that. Government as the employer of last resort. Yeah, yeah. Or wage subsidies, which is something that the Obama administration has begun thinking of in a sort of timid way, but really, but Interestingly, you know, the idea that if you lose a, a well-paid job and you have to take a job that pays much less, right. well, then there's the government can step in and fill in the gap, or at least part of the gap. So these sorts of policies that help people go into work. So, for instance, you know, child support policies and, and other supports for families that currently, you know, can't juggle home and work very well. So assistance to let them into the labor force, which right. would, you know, again, a job is the best way to... to uh, to come out of poverty and, 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 and have a decent life. So th th there is a bunch of policy possibilities. There are many, many policy possibilities. The, the problem, and it's always been the obstacle in the United States, has been political will. Right. Political We've will. always yeah. been very, very hostile to these whole sets of this interventions. This is all expanding government. Exactly. It's all about expanding government. And expanding government is not something that we have done. I mean, if you look at the size of, 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 of our tax take, in the United States, as compared to the size of the economy, it's been roughly flat th since the 1960s. Right. If you look at every other rich country, it's done like that. <laughs> Going up. Going up. Because as countries get richer, they demand more. They demand, you know, as they demand universal health care. They consider it a right, and they want it, and that has to be paid for, you know. Um, so so um, we have been, we have really bucked the trend of the developed world on this. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been wonderful. We've run out of time. We have to wrap it up. I wish we could talk more, actually. Uh, Eduardo Porter, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Bob. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Whatever you may think of Barack Obama's policies, it's undeniable that he has conducted himself with dignity and grace and a level of personal composure worthy of the presidency. He has been a first-rate role model for every young person in this country. 
That is, regrettably, not the case with some of the candidates for president in the Republican Party this year. The language, the foulness of some of the discourse, the relentless and often repellent personal attacks have been sickening. That they are occurring in a presidential campaign strikes me as almost unbelievable. This ongoing spectacle is obviously a terrible example for young men and women who may be thinking about becoming involved in our civic and political processes. I'm sure many first-time voters in their late teens and early 20s are thinking that this is normal behavior for candidates aspiring to be president. This is a free country, and free speech, especially political speech, is a cornerstone of our system of values as Americans. So candidates are free to behave in ways that degrade our civic and political traditions. But those same freedoms give all of us as voters the right to push back and to make it clear that the kind of offensive behavior that we've been subjected to in this campaign will not be tolerated, much less rewarded. That's all for now. See you next time.